Hello everyone, this is John Buck. Uh, in this array signal processing video, I'm going to talk about what happens when a plane wave propagating through space encounters a uniform line array. A uniform line array is an array where all the sensors are connected together on a single line uh, and they're equally spaced by some distance d between them. Um, this is a case we'll be studying a lot in the class this semester because you can build fundamental intuitions about most important array processing concepts just by thinking about line arrays and the math is much simpler. So we build our intuition there before we take it to more complicated 2 and 3D arrays or non-uniform arrays later in the semester. Uh, and so what we're going to build up to in this video is something called the array manifold vector or it's sometimes also called a replica vector which is a vector of complex numbers that represents a given plane wave as it is observed by our uniform line array. And we'll, this will be a fundamental mathematical definition we'll be using over and over again when we talk about how spatial filters or, or beamformers work in this class uh, and how we're going to model propagation. Okay? One of our consistent strategies in class is going to be that when we, have, uh, when we come across a new idea, we're going to try to talk about it in general conceptual terms of what's going on in the physical world first and build up a little intuition about how things behave and then switch over and do the detailed mathematical analysis to get a deeper understanding of what's going on and how we model it mathematically. Uh, so in this case, here's a very simple picture. This is a, a slide I borrowed from one of my seminar talks. Here's a very simple uniform line array like this, where the, the dots represent the sensors and they're spaced by D along this line. The dashed lines represent the wave fronts of a propagating wave, plane wave, coming in to encounter the array. And this little arrow down here is showing the direction of propagation. So it's propagating in this direction, and so theta is the angle formed between uh, the line of the array and the direction of propagation, which, and we call theta the angle of arrival or sometimes the direction of arrival. And so if we think about what's going to happen with these plane waves, this red plane wave front has just encountered the top sensor, and as it continues traveling, a little while later it will reach this sensor, and then a little while later it will continue along the same direction of propagation, the same wave front will reach this sensor. And so we can see, we'd expect to see the same signal in this plane wave hitting each sensor one after the other, but with some delay as it works its way down the chain. And that's what I've shown in the right column here is sort of a typical propagating tone signal, a little pulse with five periods of a sinusoid. And then each of these figures is, is the, time, the sort of uh, trace, the voltage versus time or pressure versus time trace uh, at each sensor. So this horizontal axis is time. This is voltage, and we can see we see the same waveform reappearing at each sensor, but it, as we expect, with a little delay from each one, and this red diagonal line is sort of showing, uh, representing sort of the wavefront in some sense, showing that delay as we go from sensor to sensor. And so that's what we expect to see with our array. When we go to build a spatial filter in big picture terms, what we want to do is take these copies for a given look direction. We want to pick a direction and say, I want to figure out what energy is coming from that direction. In order to do that, I'm going to solve what the time delay would have been if there is any energy coming from that direction and basically undo those time shifts. We're going to shift the signals in the opposite direction so that any energy coming from that direction will be lined up for coherent or constructive interference. And so if we go to the next slide, we see an example of what that would look like. Right? If I've applied undone those delays for the, for the same direction the wave was coming from, the signals will all be lined up, and now when I sum things across the array or average across the array, all this energy will combine constructively, and I'll get positive reinforcement showing the energy from that direction. Signals coming from other directions won't be lined up. They may be not, you know, if they're a little bit off, they'll still have a good effect, but if they get further away, we'll see that the different waves will actually cancel each other out when we add them, and, and we'll get some what's called destructive interference. So in a big picture, that's what we're talking about a lot in this class when we, when we focus on uniform line arrays and plane waves, is this idea of taking signals that are coming from a certain direction that have a characteristic delay from sensor to sensor. This time delay is the physically observable, measurable thing we always have to think about that we're coming back to, that we're starting from. And then we're going to be trying to measure these time delays or estimate these time delays by undoing them and seeing how much coherent energy we get from a direction once we've undone them. Okay, so now let's pick up with a more detailed analysis, making, making these things uh, more mathematical. Again, plane waves and uniform line arrays. We're going to assume we have an array of n sensors, and I guess an important uh, convenient assumption, though not necessary, is that we're going to assume n is an odd number, that we have an odd number of sensors. And the reason that's convenient 
is if we have an odd number of sensors, we can put one of the, the middle sensor at the origin and then have the array be symmetric on either side of it. So we're going to assume our array has uh, n sensors that we're going to index their locations along, let's we'll say, the z-axis here to be consistent with the Van Trees book. Uh, so these, lo these locations are z sub 0, z sub 1, and so on, up to z sub n minus 1. As we go from 0 to n minus 1 is n sensors. And the middle one, which is z sub n minus 1 over 2, is at the origin. So that's this point here in the middle at z equals 0. And again, as, as we had on the previous slide, we're going to assume these sensors are spaced by the same distance, some uniform distance d between them. And so now let's put our, our plane wave front onto this figure. We'll assume we have a, a plane wave coming in across the array again. And uh, let me shift that just a little. So here's our plane wave encountering our first sensor. And again, I'll put the propagation direction here in blue. Uh, is, is Make that turn that back into a line. Trying to keep that looks about perpendicular. So again, this will be our The blue is, is the direction of propagation. And this angle here between the array axis and the direction of propagation, theta, is the, is the uh, angle of arrival. Right? We say that theta is the direction of arrival or the angle of arrival. So we assume this plane wave is coming in and arriving at the array. So we sometimes call this DOA. All right, and so when we do this, we're going to we say, well, like like we showed on the previous slide, just sort of reiterating, we'd expect as, as this wave front propagates along, it's going to hit the first, the top sensor and then the next one and the next one and the next one. So the signal at each sensor is going to be the same signal with some delay between them. And so we'll define uh, f of t is our basic signal, will be the signal observed in time at z equals 0, the middle sensor of the array. And then we can say we let, in general, we'll say f sub n of t is equal to the signal observed at the nth sensor. So when we think of it that way, each signal, f sub n of t, is just the original signal with some delay tau sub n, right, which is the delay specific to that sensor. We say, well, how does that delay relate to the, uh, from one sensor to the next? Well, that we can do using the fact this is a plane wave and some basic trigonometry. We can say, well, for example, uh, if, if I uh, think about the delay, let me shift the propagation arrow just a little bit here. So it's hitting the zero sensor. I should these two maybe? Yep. So if I think about the delays represented by this axis, which is going to be proportional, or this, this length here, which is the pro distance, is proportional to the cosine of theta times this, this point here. And then this, this, the time it takes me to travel that will be based on c, the prop propagation speed. Right? So we can say that, that, in fact, tau sub n is going to be proportional to cos of theta times z of n all over c. And then the other thing we need to think about carefully here is that, in fact, uh, when, when theta is going towards small angles, we should actually hit these sensors first, which means we need a negative delay. Right? It's going to hit these sensors prior to the center sensor. Right? Uh, so I, I should have mentioned f of t. I guess another way to say this here is this will be f of f sub n minus 1 over 2 t. Right? That's the middle sensor at the origin. Right, so when I when I formulate it that way, the, the, the based on we call this point in the middle also another name for that is the we call this the phase center of the array. The center sensor, the middle of the sensor, is sometimes called the phase center of the array. And we'll see why um, as as we go through the semester that will become clearer. But so by setting it up this way, and then I can substitute in z of n in general is going to be um, n minus n minus 1 over 2, that's the center sensor, times d, right? So when 
just to check and make sure this makes sense, when little n is 0, this will be a negative point. It'll be Down here will be at minus n minus 1 over 2, right? Because I'm that many sensors below the origin. And then when I go up the other direction, when I get to n minus 1 for the upper sensor, I'll be left with plus n minus 1 over 2 times d. Right, so this is this is my time delay that we were talking about conceptually on the previous slide. So that's what's going on in the time domain, and a lot of the things in this semester we'll, we'll want to think about things in the frequency domain. So let's think about what's going to happen then. We say, well, I could take the Fourier transform, we could let, we'll call it capital F sub n of omega be the Fourier transform. of fn of t. Get my drawing panel out of the way for a second. Okay, so that's our, our Fourier transform. And then we say, well, I know in that case, because things are delayed in time, well, you might pause the video for a second and remind yourself, if I delay something in time, what happens in frequency? Okay, now we're back. And now you've hopefully tested your memory or looked it up. We say that, that this will be the original f of omega times an exponential. It'll be e to the minus j omega tau sub n, right? Because if I delay by t sub n in time, I multiply by e to the minus j omega tau sub n in the Fourier transform domain. And so what the next step we want to take is actually we're going to collect all these uh, Fourier transforms together. We could define... Yeah, move all the way to the left margin now that I'm past the figure. We could define a, a, a vector, so capital F underbar of omega. So this is the Fourier transforms of all the sensors collected together, from F0, the Fourier transform of the zero sensor, up to F minus 1 of omega. Right? When we do that, we're going to see we'd have, based on what we've seen here, we'd have f of omega. When n equals 0, I'll have e to the minus j omega tau sub 0, the delay for the 0 sensor for the first sensor, and so on, all the way up to the last sensor. And when we look at these vectors, we can say, oh, there's that common f of omega in all of them. I could just pull that out front. And in fact, when I do that, it's kind of a, it, it gives me a nice factored representation. We can say the, the vector of all the Fourier transforms has this common Fourier transform in front that is the signal of interest. And then it's multiplying a, a vector where there's one element, one complex number for each sensor. And these, these complex numbers are the phases representing the relative delay from sensor to sensor. Right, and now we can go plug in for these taus and, and look at what happens next. We could say, well, then this would be fw, f omega, e to the minus j, Omega times uh, <clears throat> the uh, cosine of theta. Um, oh, I forgot it's minus cosine of theta. Time, because the tau, right, the t naught would be the, the uh, minus that, minus the tau above. Times uh, cos theta times zn. over C. And they, again, all this is coming from, I should just scroll back a little bit, up here, right? That's, it said Tn is minus cos theta Zn over C. So we're plugging that in here. Oh, except that should be Z sub 0 for the 0 sensor over C. And then so on, all the way down to the nth sensor. Or, I'm sorry, the n minus first sensor.
right? And then a common substitution we often make at this point to, to simplify things, uh, and we'll be using a lot, is, is we'll call, we'll define u to be cos theta. And we'll see this has some very helpful properties when we think about things in terms of, this is called the directional cosine. Rather than, first of all, it makes the notation simpler, but also we'll see that, that it allows us actually to build, as the semester goes on, we'll see this allows us to build on our DSP uh, instinct. So we'll put these two minus signs together. We get an e to the j omega z naught u over c for the first one, and all the way down to e to the j omega z n minus 1 u over c here. And there's a bunch of equivalent versions of this we'll use, but I'll, I'll, I'll pause here and say this, this right-hand vector now, this is what we call the array manifold vector. We could say this is a vector that is implicitly, we can write it as a function of u, or we could write it as a function, sometimes we'll, we'll write it as a function of theta, or the two notations we'll use most often to represent direction. Right? But this basically, once we know the frequency of the signal and we know the array, this vector sort of characterizes the response of the array or how the array measures a plane wave from the direction where u is equal to the cosine of theta or we can use it directly in theta. Another uh, simplification we often make here is, is remembering back that uh, omega over c, right, omega over c we know from, from uh, propagation in waves is 2 pi over lambda. Right, we can uh, so we can use that substitution here, and another one uh, that we might also use would be uh, to to plug in for z sub n. Right, we say z sub n, as I had above, is is n minus n minus one over two times d, and that tells me that the location. So if I put all this in, the first element will become e to the j. <coughs> omega times, uh, when this is 0, I'll have minus n minus 1 over 2 d. Oh, I forgot. And then I'm replacing that omega also by omega over c by 2 pi over lambda. Or we can just call it k. Why don't we just put that in for now? We'll call this. This is also another name. This is often called k or, or k naught for a given frequency. That, not the, it's not the vector wave number, it's the magnitude of the vector wave number. Right, so I have k times, as I said a minute ago, I'd have the, the two minus signs would cancel out. So I'd have n minus 1 over 2 times d for the first element. No, wait, I made a mistake there. So the, right, when, when n is 0, this will still be negative. I've already replaced two of the minuses here. I'm sorry to make a bit of a mess of this. But that's how you know it's live and not the 20th take. So when, when n equals 0, the z sub n will, that I'm plugging in for z sub 0 will be minus n minus 1 over d. And so this will be e to the minus j. Uh, omega over c is k. I'll have n minus 1 over 2 times d times u. And so on through the vector. I'll have 1 in the middle that's 1, and so on down into the last one will be e to, for the last element. It'll be e to the j k n minus 1 over 2 d times u. And so this is another equivalent form of the replica vector with using u, or I could replace u again by by cos theta and, and get back. And, and what these are are complex exponentials representing the phase or the delay as I go across the array. And we, as we said, for the, the way we've defined the coordinate system, when theta is small and, and u is close to 1, we'll have positive phase for the high element vectors, or the high element sensors because they get hit first and it works its way down to the low element sensors here. And so this is a, uh, an important thing. Again, that's important enough, maybe I should move up a little bit and write it again. So we have what's called the array manifold vector. Or sometimes also called the replica vector. 
And again, this is this is characterizing what we would see. The vector v of u, or we can say v of theta, of complex uh, numbers representing the phase. And then as the way we've defined the coordinate systems here, these would start uh, with <clears throat> e to the minus j k d times n minus 1 over 2 times u. Counting the way through, I'd get to one of them where it's just e to the minus j. I'd be counting these indices n down, so I'd eventually get one that's e to the minus j k d u. I'd have one where the exponent was 0. That's the phase center. This would be the n equals n minus 1 over 2 term. And then as I keep working my way across the array, I'd have e to the j k d u and so on up to e to the j k d. So the same thing that I started with but with positive phase for the for the n minus first sets here. And so this is a vector sort of piling them all up. And what's nice about this is is it separates out in some sense it separates out somewhat the effect of the time domain frequency and the uh, spatial effect. Right, that, that by coming back up where we started, we say the overall vector, this was the vector of all the Fourier transforms, F sub w. I have factored out, this is the Fourier transform of the propagating signal, and then this array manifold vector v contains the, the phase contributed by the spatial properties of the array. Okay, so that's plenty for now. I'm going to stop here. We'll pick up the story in class then talking about how we now use this idea to make spatial filters and talk about the beam pattern, which is a way of understanding how a given spatial filter will uh, amplify or attenuate plane waves coming from different directions. All right, thanks. I'll see you next time.